Okay, hello everyone. We're uh, getting everybody in from the waiting room right now. Okay, I think everybody's in. Uh, welcome to our latest online artist talk uh, presented by the Maloof. I'm your host, Seth Pringle. I'm a uh, program manager at the Sam and Alfreda Maloof Foundation for Arts and Crafts in Alta Loma. Uh, just so you all know, we just started reopening uh, our site again with some altered uh, op operations. So if you want to come visit us, uh, just know that you have to purchase a ticket in advance to reserve your spot and check out our website for all the details um, of our precautions and uh, alterations to how we're running things uh, in our in the current environment. So we hope to see you out at the Maloof very soon. Uh, today's artist talk is with uh, Mary Byerly. Very excited to have her with us. She uh, <clears throat> has exhibited at the Maloof before in our Sculpture in the Garden exhibitions. Um, so a little bit about Mary before I hand it over to her. Mary began her formal art studies after living in Europe and Asia and working on documentaries with contemporary Native American concerns. She received her BFA and MFA from CSU Long Beach. She's received art grants to study Alaskan glaciers, European Paleolithic art in Germany, Spain, and France and art studies in Italy, Korea, and China. Her art is in international public and private collections and has been exhibited in the United States, Asia, and Europe, including the Li Shui Museum of Art in China, the Fete uh, Picasso, Valoris, France. Um, <clears throat> the American Museum of Ceramic Art, the Shoshana Wayne Gallery, the Salt Brand, Ceramic, Koblenz, Germany, the National Council for Education and Ceramic Arts, and the Orange County Center for Contemporary Art, and the Sam and Alfredo Maloof Foundation for Arts and Crafts. Currently, Mary is an adjunct professor of art at Chafee and Cypress Colleges and a resident artist at AMOCA. This year, she is also volunteering as the art director at Chirp Locally Grown Power. This Claremont Pomona Chirp initiative is creating the first nonprofit solar factory in the world with the mission to comprehensively address the four top priorities in the United States, climate change, job creation, environmental and social justice, and local economic revitalization. So very excited to uh, welcome Mary. And uh, hello, Mary, I'm handed it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate being here. Uh, Sam Malouf was one of the first organizations or institutions to purchase my work. And that's helped me decide to go ahead and uh, try seeing what it would be like to be an artist and if I could do that. So, I, and I appreciate, I love exhibiting in the gardens and I love sending my students to visit all the fabulous exhibitions that you constantly have. Um, so thank you. I'd also, once again, like to thank my family. I'm not sure I could be an artist. It's a lonely and sometimes um, noisy in my head job being an artist, but I really appreciate the support I have from my husband, Devin Hartman, and my children, Megan and Emily. So thank you all. And, and my teachers, especially um, the Maloof is associated with Chafee College and that's where I started my art studies. And I have to say, I think if I had started anywhere else, I might not be an artist today. So I appreciate all the um, wonderful teachers there too. So I'm gonna go ahead and share screen. All right, let's do it. Okay. Okay, uh, so I am definitely a maker and I enjoy making, I enjoy sweating. I, I love and hate the challenge of working on a large 
scale, moving that heavy work around. Uh, most of the time I do work in clay. I have worked in bronze and photography and video and some other media, but I love clay. And I have to say, uh, once I brought up Chafee College, I'm really grateful to my first two teachers there, Barbara Thompson and Crispin Gonzalez, because they studied with the Volcus Group people. And for my very first class, I was doing really goofy things. I thought they were goofy. I was throwing my clay on the ground. I was ripping it. And I was taking outside and making impressions of rocks and stuff. And Barbara Thompson and Chris Gonzalez uh, never thought uh, they encouraged it and encouraged experimentation that um, I continue to this day. So I'm so grateful for their uh, constant um, support. So I studied biology. I was a wife and homemaker, helped my husband with his business. And then in the late 90s, uh, we took a trip to France. And we went to Lascaux to, to see the recreations of the Paleolithic art. And I don't know what happened inside my brain, but it kind of exploded. And so for the next five years, I was constantly dreaming in ceramic sculpture. And the cave paintings are not ceramic. Um, ceramics did happen with Paleolithic art, but I didn't see it at that time. I saw these paintings, so I don't know why. I was dreaming in clay, but I was, and it had political content and personal content. Uh, and I was just needing to get my hands in clay. And so um, one day my husband said, you're always doing everything for us. Why don't you do something for yourself? And um, I signed up for a sculpture class at Chafee College. And I had the good fortune, like I said, to start with Barbara Thompson and then uh, Chris Gonzalez, who's um, passed away, but he still lives on in a lot of our memories. And I was in this crazy class where we we're experimenting wildly. And um, I came in through sculpture and he said to me, what are you doing there? You need lots of work. You know, if anybody knows Chris, he's a really gruff guy, some in, outside gruff, inside teddy bear, right? And so he took me over to the wheel to show me how to throw and I was sculpting with porcelain. And so I was throwing with porcelain and he was trying to throw, I don't know what he was trying to show me how to throw, but I immediately became um, excited about the possibilities of clay as a material and the process of making and the transformative processes that clay has. And I started creating these abstract sculptures. I had no idea where they were coming from at the time, but I kept doing them over and over and over. And um, my first exhibitions were involving this series. I still continue this series to today. But for example, this was porcelain that I then used a, a low salt technique. And I, I covered that porcelain with this mud of various kinds of clay and uh, salt fired in a salt fire technique uh, that Chris had sent me to see, uh, have a class with Paul Solner. And I'm so uh, fortunate to hear some of the first words out of Paul Solner's mouth was um, embrace the accident, because these were accidents. And someone in the studio in my class was going around saying, well, Mary doesn't know how to throw a big pot and those were accidents. And so I was feeling so much shame and was embarrassed of my series. And then Paul Soldner says, no, embrace the accidents, the happy accident. And um, from that, you can then explore it and it's no longer an accident, you know, it's your own work. And so I'm very grateful. There's a lot of gratitude along the way in this talk. I'm just very, grateful. It's another one, um, early piece from this series. Um, as I was doing this series, I had to start writing about it and giving it titles and things like that. And I realized it's about, one of the deepest meanings is about personal transformation and how uh, I was raised Catholic 
And in Catholicism, woman, Eve, handed off the forbidden fruit to Adam and caused the downfall of all mankind. And I heard that emphasized a lot when I was growing up in, in, uh, in church. And so then as an adult studying Buddhism, more at your core that you're beautiful and you're perfect, I started making personal mental psychological transformation. And so these pieces are about throwing off the, the pieces that, for example, you see the little bits on there that um, our family tells us, our society tells us, our, uh, our, our institutions tell us, our media tells us, and ripping those apart to uh, exhibit the beauty that's underneath. Um, like Seth mentioned, I uh, lived in Japan and Europe for a while, and seeing Japanese art was transformational for me also, because they have this aesthetic where you embrace the humble and you embrace the imperfect. And so uh, when my pieces would crack or when they would have um, debris on them, I embraced that. We, we don't get to go through life without um, constantly having to uh, shed the detritus um, of mistakes or, or things. I began to think of these as little bonsais. Uh, when I was a child before, when I was still a toddler, my mom loved the Huntington Library and Gardens. And one of my favorite areas were the bonsai because we camped a lot and I loved being in nature. And I could look at these little bonsai and feel like I was in a forest. And so though these sculptures, well, some of them are 36 inches, but the initial ones were very small. And so I could embrace that smallness like a bonsai tree as a place for meditation and, and beauty. Oops. Just another one of my pieces um, that um, is showing it kind of like a, a meditation. Um, I still continue this series and a couple of years ago, CJ Gillick, who spoke at one of your conferences, at one of your talks earlier, is on FaceTime, really good talk. And I uh, gathered 13 of our favorite artists who were working with the Flower and Ticket to an Ensika conference that at the time was in, um, Pennsylvania, uh, Pittsburgh. And it was so delightful being surrounded by all these different images of the flower and how they were being used to discuss environmental issues, personal issues, sexual issues, family issues, um, just the, the limitless um, uh, possibilities that were available. With, uh, that women have been using the flower subversively uh, to discuss issues for thousands of years, historically. Just a uh, close up on that piece and a detail. And I had never used pink before, um, and, but I wanted it to be fleshy. So I was having a, a, a ton of fun with um, these tones and just the, gobs and gobs of clay. When I'm doing my processes, um, I layer my, uh, my glazes, sometimes mm, I, 20, 30 layers of glaze, and I'll do multiple firings to create a crust that's going on in the work. Here's another recent piece. This is at the Li Shui Museum in uh, China. Um, not only exploration of materials and experimental, I did various firings of this until I was happy and I was happy that they were happy. Detail of it. I don't really know what's going to happen. This isn't glaze, this is porcelain and then I have just materials on here. There's dirt from a garden, my garden. There's um, various clays. Clays 
because of the way that they're made with uh, the uh, weathering of stone can have different colors. They can be white, yellow, gray, purple, brown. And so as I, I walk around um, on my tracks, I'll, I'll take some clay home and put it into my work. The blue here is from cobalt. I mean, yeah, cobalt, there's iron, uh, chrome, various things in there. Here's a, a current piece I'm currently working on, trying to figure out how I'm gonna finish it, um, a detail of that. But I love this series. I've, I find that I'm constantly going from the internal, personal um, to the community. In 2009, I read about a very small sculpture not even four inches tall, made out of horn that was found in Germany. Uh, people often refer to these as Venus figures, or many people are familiar with the Venus of Willendorf figure. And they're all very small. And so often archaeologists, art historians, usually male, sorry guys, um, often refer to them as um, a Venus, which is limiting them, and it's, I think, insulting. Um, but they um, have called them pornography, and they've called them perhaps toys for children. And one, when they found this, and the German scientifically dated it to between uh, 37,000 years old to 40,000 years old, they had this exhibit, and so. Um, is it pornography or is it a goddess is what this exhibit was about. And I wrote some grants to go visit that and see Paleolithic sites in Germany, Spain, and France. So I got to see 40,000 years of images of the woman. And that was quite a treat. As you can see, they're very small. But um, back in the Paleolithic period, uh, Europeans were nomadic. So things that they valued, they would carry with them. And with climate chaos and the melting of ice, um, they found one of, oops, sorry. One of these figures, and you can see that the, the feet are very small and insignificant, but that's because and this uh, Siberian site, they discovered that they would create in the cave wall uh, an, a little bowl filled with sand and they would poke the Venus figure into that uh, in, in perhaps a sacred way. There's no writings on it, so it's speculation. But there, I've seen hundreds of them and some of them are 3,000 years old, and some of them are 40,000 years old. So I think it was a very significant, meaningful. And if you think about creation, where does that come from? But it got me thinking about being a woman myself and the various cycles I go through. So as a maker, there's a hand. I love the hand. And so I was also thinking about uh, at the time, I also saw this sculpture that's about 2,000 years old that's now in the Louvre in Paris. And this beautiful, um, strong female form. And so thinking of that as an iconic visual for classic uh, sculpture and civilization, perhaps. And I uh, created an exhibition using some of these images in my own work. So this was my version of the, the Samothrace, the winged victory of Samothrace at the Louvre. And I recreated it in kind of a bolder or a sculptural way, hearkening to geological formation. Hike, hiking and camping with my family was one of the only sane activities we did. It was pretty chaotic and sometimes violent, but um, there was so much joy and awe in nature and it was so healing for me. So this sculpture reprises me as the strong person um, 
understanding that we are all strong inside, internally. Um, this series, like I said, is very personal, looking at stages of being a woman. So this celebrates the menarch, the first day of a girl's period. And when I exhibit it, often women, when they find out what the title means, they'll actually, I've seen people weep. And then I give them a flower that you see on the bottom, a petal. And that exhibition started with about a thousand of those petals thanks to my daughter and um, my nephew helping me make those flowers. And, and so I just give them as a gift and just ask that uh, wherever they put it, they send me a picture. This one is about aging. And as we age, there's so much emphasis put on women, um, our, our beauty, right? Our physical manifestation and no one can hang on to that forever. But we're still beautiful, harking back to that wabi-sabi or humble, the beauty and the humble, and you know, these layers of our life, these layers of our skin, um, and, and these attachments. I, I cast some um, of the, this bizarre, object I found, I cast it in aluminum and added it to, it's just like we have fibroids and things happening to our bodies as we age. Um, I am a California girl born and raised, fortunate to have lived in Europe and Asia, uh, but my primary memories were of stone. I, I love Yosemite and the surrounding mountains we have here. I live rather close and hike in our mountains. And I'm always bringing back um, images of nature and, and stone into my work. And of course, we have these beautiful deserts. And we've been having these huge drought cycles in California, place in when I was working on the documentaries, the Native American elders said to me, where it's dry will be drier, where it's wet will be wetter, we're not taking care of the Mother Earth, and we will see the consequences of that unless we change our behavior. And so, um, and simultaneously, as I was witnessing death of lakes and, and forests, like at this point, I think we've lost over 120 million pine trees in, this, in the Sierras, in our mountains. But I was thinking about that. So that I was playing with uh, clay again. This is just clay drying on my skin. It's, I found it so lovely and horrible, uh, sublime and you know, disgusting simultaneously. Um, and created this series I call Weeping Underwater, ironically, because we're having droughts, so it's, I wish I was weeping underwater. Um, this piece too is part of that series, and when I exhibit it publicly, I invite people to write a note, like a wailing wall, a geological wailing wall, um, and so people are invited to write a note and stick it into their crevices. This is um, part of that series too, where I was playing with adding things into my clay and I put some popcorn in my, my clay and it started growing. So I created this piece and purposely was growing corn in these pods that you see on here. And uh, the viewer, when they would enter the gallery, would be invited to spray water on the piece because if no one sprayed water on there, that corn would die and the roots and the stalks would shrivel up. As a metaphor for how we have to nurture our children, how we have to nurture um, each other, how we have to nurture our communities and nurture our planet in relationship. We're always in relationship. 
just a detail of that. So here's an image of Chief Oren Lyons. Um, he became a friend while I was working on the documentaries with Native American Concerns um, called A Circle of Women. And he used to say to us, oh, you think you have problems, but it's not the problems you think. You know, the ice is melting, the ice caps are melting. And that is gonna be creating food problems and housing problems and um, devastating problems for all of us. So that was going on in my mind for a long time. And so I wrote some grants to go study the largest calving glacier in North America, in Alaska, in the, the Hubbard Glacier in the Bay of Disenchantment. That's what the, this bay is named, the Bay of Disenchantment. And the Hubbard Glacier is over 300 feet tall, over 600 feet into the bay and six miles across. And I was having trouble finding someone who would take my husband and I onto a boat out there because it was fishing season. And they make a lot of money fishing salmon and cod in these, um, the waters near here. But fortunately, there was a guy who graduated from Cal State Long Beach. And so he said, oh, okay, I'll take you. So that was fortuitous. And magnificent because he took all the scientists out to this gla uh, glacier. So he gave us this very intimate tour. And because we are in this little boat, we actually went very close. Um, cruise ships can't come within a half mile. And we were probably, I don't know, 100 feet from this uh, glacier footing. It was awesome and inspiring. Um, I also was told that perhaps if we rented a truck and drove on this 30 mile dirt road and hike, uh, went across the bridge to nowhere literally and uh, dragged some kayaks into this lake called Harlequin Lake that there might be some calved glaciers stuck out there in this lake. So my husband and I hauled up, uh, did all that and hauled these um, canoes and spent the day alone with these glaciers. And hiking, we also took a, a trek into this ice cave. It's hard to get perspective on this, but this is as big as a football stadium. It was otherworldly and actually confusing as an artist um, how I was gonna transfer this information into artwork. I wasn't sure if I would ever be able to. It was, um, profoundly and emotionally um, exhilarating and exhausting. Um, but I am a maker. That's me as a kid. And I think that's the Snake River of um, making something. I was always making something. So I went to, oops, I went to work and started creating uh, after months of just letting that die just um, for this series i've made tons of, of clay trying to use recycled clay whenever possible reducing the temperatures that i'm firing to so i'm not uh, wasting any more energy than i need to or as little as possible And I took some of these works into uh, gallery settings. And I made a video with the help of uh, my daughter, Megan, and em my daughters, Megan and Emily, one of our friends, Doug, and my husband. And um, threw that video up on the wall and so, and invited people to come into the gallery. And so the, the light and the video is, is um, projecting onto not only the sculptures, but people. Here's a detail of that work, a still from that video. And let's see if I can get this to play.
Um, so that's called breathing and Native Americans often refer to our, our earth as our mother earth. And so I was just wondering um, what, well, how should I put this? They often would say, um, don't worry about mother nature, she'll take care of it herself. But what is gonna happen to you if you're not taking care of your relationship with mother earth? And um, humans, we often walk away. And I was just wondering what would happen if Mother Nature walked away, the Mother Earth walked away. So once again, um, when I was thinking about how, how am I going to collectively show, exhibit this work? And this work isn't 300 feet tall. and um, feeling uncomfortable that it's not that big compared to nature herself. And once again, the, um, the Japanese uh, tradition saved me and gave me a way to reframe my work, just like the Zen garden at the Huntington Library, where these aren't 300 or 600 or 10,000 foot high um, high mountain peaks and that's not an ocean that we're looking at but humans have such a capacity for imagination that um, I just needed to do my work and 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 let what happens happen so so I you know put them into a gallery and unlike a Zen a, a traditional Zen garden, you would be relegated to be sitting at a certain area. But I wanted the humans to be part of these sculptures. And I actually um, created these sitting cubes for people to sit on and become a sculpture and have a relationship with the sculptures. The I, some people, saw them not as glaciers, that didn't really matter to me, but they were representational uh, forms in nature. And so by sitting on a cube, you could um, deepen your relationship and uh, have a meditation uh, in the viewing cycle. Just some details of this. Um, these are each about 900 pounds. There's I was making 300 pounds. What I'm making in this series, I'm making about 300 pounds of clay every few days, um, building this cycle. I wanted the interior, I wanted it to be transformative because everything is always changing. And as these polar ice caps and these glaciers are melting, it's evolving to something else. We don't even know what else. And, these were transforming into flowers for me. Detail. Just more in this series. I have about nine of these now. A detail, like I said, I, I layer and layer and layer. Um, some of the glazes and materials are an inch thick in some of the areas. I'm throwing dirt on there, minerals that I find, um, just playing with the materials. Another view. Um, this past year, in uh, 2019, I was invited by Joyce Cole and Cal State Bakersfield to come up and be involved in a program they've been having for 30 years where they've invited artists from around the world and they can work in any material, metal or wood or fiber. Uh, and they had purchased this very large kiln about six years ago and no one had used it yet. So they invited me to come up and do a, um, a project with the students. Um, so I got to work with the class and um, this is a handful of some of the most dedicated students working on the project with me. Uh, I love collaboration a lot. It's very joyous for me to be um, working with my family or interested people. 
Um, so I created another Semethrice, this one for Cal State Bakersfield. They're waiting for COVID things to settle down before they install it. So that's obviously not installed there, but that's the finished glaze piece. Um, using details, uh, I was driving there and just the cloud formation and the rows upon rows of uh, vegetation and cultivation and being surrounded in this huge valley by these beautiful uh, mountains, sierras and other mountain ranges. Um, this is another piece that I did there that's uh, prior to being glazed um, that uh, hopefully will be headed to Amoka for an outdoor installation. An another collaborative piece I did thinking of sustainability was at the uh, Pomona College Organic uh, Farm. And I, a past uh, alum of Pomona College donated money and his son um, created these gates. And I spent six months making the panels going on these benches here and in the interior walls of the, the Pomona farm gate. Shout out to Wendy Thoris and my beautiful studio um, assistant for that. And for Ron Fleming for donating the money for this. Just some detail shots. I spent weeks and actually months hiking and seeing the vegetation that was growing there. The pumpkins and Swiss chard and this beautiful Fibonacci sequenced um, broccoli, beautiful eggplant. I mean, was, the crops there are so beautiful. If you're in the community, you actually can volunteer and participate in the beautiful food that it creates. Uh, let me go back. Um, so this side of the wall was indigenous, oops, indigenous plants. The left side of the, the mural involved because they have a Native American indigenous uh, plantings there. And so the left side contained California poppies and sage uh, and a lot of herbs and plants that Native Americans use in ceremony. And then the right side of the wall created a uh, celebration of the, the beautiful foods grown inside the garden. And I was asked if I would consider making it a rainbow to celebrate the diversity. And I thought that was a beautiful idea. So um, it starts with all of the colors of the rainbow um, uh, and, and creating this visual spectacle of color for the gates. This is my, uh, one of my current projects. I'm, a I'm the volunteer art director for the world's first nonprofit solar factory. And I jumped at the opportunity uh, to take this empty space, um, the cities of Claremont and Pomona have joined together to create this, um, work with CHIRP. So one sec, I'm sorry. And they're addressing really very important, timely issues of climate change and social and um, environmental injustice, the majority of Pollution is happening in areas of, of low income of our brothers and sisters of color. And these factory, this factory is meant to be replicated across California, across the United States, bringing um, jobs, manufacturing, and um, uh, addressing climate change issues. I'm so proud of it and proud to be working in this. It's quite daunting to be filling this space, so I'm glad it's a collaboration. Um, I'll be reaching out to 
additional artists, but currently I'm working with our beloved Athena Hahn, who's a local artist. Here's an image that she's uh, finishing up for the Pomona Library and will be installed soon. Um, Peter Erskine was a Southern California artist. He's now moved up to Oregon, but he, cre he uses solar light to create and brings in with mirrors and prisms into interior spaces and has uh, discovered the healing properties that it imbues. And so we wanted to create a space of beauty and shift the paradigm on what a factory is supposed to look like. Um, we wanted it to be healing and helpful and uplifting. And uh, Peter's volunteered to bring one of his rainbow art to in inside the cellar factory that we can walk through every day. And he brought with him a Bruce Audland, a sound thinker. And he takes the discordant sounds that are so disharmonious to our contemporary brains that are used to sounds from nature. And he's not transforming them into nature, but he takes this sound tube. You can see him right here holding this sound tube. So he collects the sounds of an environment, for example, the factory. And then he, he's, a, he's a composer and, uh, and transformative thinker. And so these th sounds that we will be having in our environment in the factory will be collected and modulated so that it feels harmonious and also helps create a very humane and um, environmentally and psychologically sensitive environment. And he and, um, and Peter have both volunteered their time for this factory, we're so grateful. I'm still creating new work. Um, this year has been a hard one and we don't even know, we're still in the middle of it, right? With the climate, cha climate chaos and um, really looking, hoping, peeling back the, the racial injustices that are going on in our community. And um, I started thinking about memorials, um, the stele, which have been used for thousands of years um, historically, and wanting to create stele to, to not only, they're used for celebration and memorials. And I'm just at the beginning stages of that, um, not in, not exactly sure. These are my maquettes still, and I'm collaborating with the amazing artist um, Elise Price, um, who I met in grad school at Cal State Long Beach, and she also teaches there. So um, we're just at the beginning stages, so it'll be exciting to see where that goes. And coming back to the hand again, um, I'm a maker. But the Native Americans used to say, you know, we, we always have choices, which path we're going to take. Are, are we going to create? Are we going to create relationships? Are we going to create beauty? And, um, you know, my wish is um, to use my art to inspire, um, to help uh, people become thoughtful about their environment. And uh, thank you. That's it. Awesome, thank you, Mary. Uh, so we're, I'm gonna invite everyone to uh, type any questions that you have for Mary uh, into the chat box. You'll see that at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we've had a couple questions already, but uh, yeah, think about uh, what you might wanna, wanna ask or uh, also just comments are, are always good too there. Uh, so, Let's see, uh, Bruce is asking uh, about your kilns. He says your kilns must be huge. Do you use brick kilns or other industrial facilities? Um, I've had the good fortune um, to work in Cal State Long Beach's huge kilns. Um, there's a large kiln where I teach at Cypress College. Um, there's 
um, and then being invited to Cal State Bakersfield. There's another large kiln. So I don't own my own kiln. Those large kilns can cost $50,000. So I'm very grateful to be able to be able to have had the privilege to working in those kilns. And uh, speaking of large scale, I'm wondering, um, you talked about in your earlier work with being very experimental. Uh, is that experimentation, are you still able to uh, feel like you're being experimental with making the large pieces or does that change in, the, in your process with scale? Yeah, I always have to let go. <laughs> you do. When I first started working on a large scale um, for a year, everything in the kiln was falling over. I didn't know how to engineer things. And I, I didn't think I was going to make anything that big. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm like, I'm short and um, it's exhausting. Um, so uh, I've had as many failures as successes. So yeah, I'm, I, I can't make the same exact thing. And um, I, I just have to experiment. I started off studying uh, biology and then uh, psychology. And in biology I, my fa and, and chemistry, my favorite was experimenting. And so I find that that's how I am, even in recipes. My husband always eats it and doesn't really complain, but um, I have a hard time sticking to a recipe too. Great, uh, so Sandy is asking, how is using mud and dirt different than clay? How do they react to firing? I find um, dirt very challenging. Um, I have to experiment to see if it's gonna melt at the mid-range temperatures that I'm normally working in unless it's porcelain, then I'll go to a higher temperature um, because there's so much organic material and iron in uh, dirt and mud that it will melt. And so um, in some of my pieces, I've actually put the, uh, the dirt or mud on top of my uh, work and then layered um, glazes over it and the and from experimentation I knew that it would uh, move more than the glaze and reveal itself through the glaze and so um, that's something I play with often. And uh, Marie is asking if you're using all gas-fired kilns? Uh, no, sometimes I use electric kilns. I keep being told that, um, thinking about sustainability, that um, that it's currently not possible to have a solar um, panel driven electric kiln, but the technology for CHIRP that it's using on their solar panels is brand new technology. Harvey Mudd did the white papers on it and it's up to 50% more efficient than any current, the best panels out there. And so I'm thinking that maybe in the future, if we can create a thermally responsible electric kiln that um, we'll be able to use solar electricity. Uh, that's my hope. And Lydia is asking about Chirp. She asks, what, what is Chirp? And the factory sounds fascinating to what will you be creating for it? Will you be uh, making any work or just uh, curating other artists? So far, I've um, just been curating other artists. And um, I would love to do something. I think before that, I mean, there's so many local artists that I'd love to come and have them do an installation inside. There, some art will be um, permanent. I'm hoping to work with children. Um, in, in this COVID pandemic situation where schools are closed, if anyone uh, knows or 
through their churches or maybe you're um, you have a lot of kids I'm not sure but I'm looking to incorporate children's art into it and um, and then at some point down the road um, I would like to participate also, uh, my work is always being uh, driven by the personal, political, and environmental. So I, I would like to. Um, and what is CHIRP? CHIRP is a nonprofit founded by my husband uh, 10 years ago. Um, he had an architecture and construction company, Hartman Baldwin, and his business partner is still um, continuing that. But when he realized that buildings and homes are one of the largest contributor to greenhouse gases, he left to work in the nonprofit um, arena uh, to work to see what he could do to uh, dis disassemble that, uh, that link between homes and commercial buildings and, uh, and the degradation of our planet. So this factory, um, is part of that uh, initiative to um, create jobs and um, great energy and make our planet a better place. So I, I enjoyed hearing about uh, you getting started with classes at Chafee and how that experience kind of uh, launched you. So uh, uh, Kira is asking uh, if you have advice to folks who want to get into art um, if you're in the area, I highly recommend um, starting at the community college level. Um, I teach at a couple community colleges and then I know a lot of amazing teachers. And um, I think my classes are as demanding. I also got to teach at Cal State Long Beach when I was in grad school there. I demand as much for my students as the class, but I also have such, um, a strong memory of how afraid I was to begin taking art classes. I almost didn't take my second class. I was sure I was getting a C because I was doing all these weird things and nobody else in my class was. I didn't know at the time that Barbara Thompson was part of the Volkus group that was so, uh, her, her teachers were part of the Volkus group and were so experimental and she didn't think I was doing anything strange. Um, she was just encouraging. Uh, so I think, um, you have to go into art and do what's true to yourself and stop looking at a grade or judgment or whatever else people, I was in, like I was in my forties and people, you know, they were 18 and they were doing this amazing stuff. And I was mortified every day, but I was determined and to continue because I was so curious. So follow your curiosity, let go of judgment, um, do weird stuff. Um, and, you know, ask around, find out who some good teachers are. There's so many good teachers um, out there um, to teach art these days. And, um, and then I'll just tell an interesting story, like the, the excavation series that looks like a flower or body parts, depending on who you are. And I, I had a collector who was purchasing my work and coming to my home. And I wasn't writing about it or speaking about that work at all. It was so personal. I didn't know how at the time. And um, one day when she was here and she spent about two hours looking at different um, excavation projects, works, and I said, you know, what are you thinking? What do you see when you look at this work? And she was um, a doctor at the Rand, uh, Rand Think Tank. And she told me exactly what was in my head. So I guess most importantly, if you make things that are deeply personal and um, from your heart, they somehow magically communicate to other people in a profound way. I love that. Okay, and uh, Ma uh, Marie, sorry, Marie says, you've seen the glaciers and talked to the elders. Do you still think the future is hopeful? 
my husband, the founder of Chirp, right? He's very optimistic. I have to work to be optimistic. But the elders also told me that you always have to have hope because then you'll give up if you don't have hope. And if you look at the over 500 years of desecration we've done to the Indians, Native Americans, and that I, I got to celebrate in their ceremonies and hear their wisdom and they're, they're still hopeful. Um, it's my duty to be hopeful too. That's a lesson they passed to me. Very good, very good. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's sometimes uh, takes some effort to be hopeful these days, right? <laughs> Uh, but that, uh, I think that's a good uh, a note to end on for the Q&A. Uh, thank you so much. It was great to see. Uh, I really enjoyed personally seeing all, all this work uh, that I hadn't seen before. Um, thanks to everybody who joined us today. Uh, thanks for your questions and comments. Uh, happy Father's Day to everybody out there. Uh, if you happen to join late, uh, a few people kind of came in, you know, after it was started, we we're recording it and going to be posting it to YouTube, uh, where we ha also have our previous artist talks posted to the Maloof's uh, YouTube channel. So uh, you can you can check those out uh, whenever you want. Uh, so any uh, any final words, uh, Mary? Yeah, you can um, follow me. My name's difficult to spell, but um, I'm at Mary Byerly. My beer drinking friends notice that it's beer, B-E-E-R, but you put an I in the middle of the beer and then add L-E. So Byerly, Mary Byerly, you can follow me on um, Facebook or Instagram. I'd love to see you all. Very good, definitely. All right, well, thank you. All right, uh, and I uh, hope to see everybody out at the Maloof very soon. Go to the uh, Maloof Foundation's website, find out how you can, can uh, join us maybe this uh, coming Saturday. All right, thank you again, Mary, and uh, goodbye, everyone, and hope to see you again soon. Bye. Thanks, Seth. Thank you.